Will you pray with me and for me as I pray for us all? Oh, Spirit, we cannot hear unless you open our ears. We cannot see unless you open our eyes. We will not become like you unless you open our hearts and plant your word there. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, because you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. When my mother was 18, she and her sister and some friends went off on a swimming excursion. It was an old deserted pool down by an estate. It was one of those old kind of pools where the, each side was shallow and the deep was at the center. During the course of the afternoon, she slid down one of those slopes and landed in the deep. My mother cannot swim. My mother began to drown. And because there's nothing more painful than watching someone precious to you drowning and you're helpless to save, my aunt then jumped in to save her precious baby sister, but neither could she swim. And so both began to drown. A few miles away, my grandmother was cleaning the house, and that still small but very familiar to my grandmother voice whispered, Anna, the girls are in trouble. And so my grandmother dropped into a familiar pose for her, prayed her mighty prayer, and just then, mind you, just then, a veteran in the area realized he had forgotten his watch and turned down that deserted road where he encountered the panicked friends of my mother and my aunt. And he was equipped, and so he jumped in and managed to pull them out of the water and breathe air and life back into their watery lungs. And so what the word says to us in Ephesians is true, that grace is at work in us and for us before we even take our first breath. My parents were believers in grace, so they baptized us in grace, and they raised us among the people of grace called United Methodist Church. They were wise enough to know that you can't program grace in. It's a gift of God that none of us should boast. And yet my mother decided a little extra insurance while she was waiting for grace to catch us that lest any of her four babies ever meet up with treacherous waters, she would be the equipper, which means she would send us to the YMCA for swimming lessons. <laughs> see, that's what equippers do. They look at us, they see the gift that is there, but they see the potential of what we could become. And they know the gap between that, once the grace is in, is a matter of training and not just trying. They look and see what is weak and they infuse courage and identity into us. Unless you think that swimming lessons involve just paddling around in the water a little bit. Oh no, not for my mother the equipper. Because here's the other thing about equippers, they believe this, that a gift is not a gift until it blesses someone else. And so we were not allowed to stop swimming lessons. It was not enough for us to learn how to save ourselves. We could not stop swimming lessons until we passed proficiency lifeguard status. Now I confess to you at the, t at the time, my mother the equipper did not seem like such a great gift. I wondered why it was, in fact, with God and I had this conversation, of why he did not give me to what I thought was a normal mother, <laughs> who I was sure would let me stay home on Saturday mornings and watch Scooby-Doo cartoons and eat sugar smack cereal. But here's the other thing about equippers. Maybe you figured this out. You don't argue with an equipper, especially when it's your mama. And so grace came through a grandmother who prayed us all into the kingdom. And grace came through my parents who believed in grace. And grace came to my life at 18 in the still small voice, which woke up my heart. And I realized in my amazement that the God who seemed to speak so often to my grandmother 
was now speaking to me. And at the age of 19, that grace took a name, Jesus. And he breathed air and life into my water-filled, sin-soaked lungs. Oh, church, do you remember the grace? Do you remember the moment that God woke up your heart and the world became a different color? Do you remember when the heart was strangely warmed within you, when you realized that you were part of a much bigger story than you ever imagined? Oh, church, do you remember the grace? Well, the stream of grace moved me on my journey into First Church Lewistown where they took me as a young adult and encouraged me and equipped me. And there I encountered two such equippers, namely Reverend Don Kayampa and Reverend Richard Swartz, who saw the gifts within me that I didn't even see in myself and put strange words in the same sentence with my name, like pastor. And then one day, yes, on a Christmas Eve, decided that it would be a good idea that I should preach. And so it was that the first female voice I ever heard in the pulpit was my own. Who were the equippers in your life? Who was it that saw God's gift in you and believed in you, who whispered to you, you could teach Sunday school? I think you should lead Disciple Bible the next time. You know, I think you have great gifts for Stephen's ministry or ad council chair, or yes, how many of us lay member to annual conference. Who was it that believed in you, infused life into you, spoke the dream of God into you in ways that you never even imagined about yourself? For the gift is not a gift until it blesses someone else. And Ephesians says that our journey is not complete, just knowing the gift, just receiving the gift, until we are able to walk into those works of service which God has prepared for us beforehand. That came home to me years later on a sunny afternoon, a perfect day in June when at the last minute, I decided I would join our youth and our youth leaders as a young pastor and go tubing. It was supposed to be a perfect day, three feet deep in the water, a sunny June afternoon. What's not to like? But then we came around a bend and I noticed the 30 foot wide expanse of river was all of a sudden hitting up against 30 foot wide wall of rocks. And a small opening, four feet wide, was now the only place where all that water had to go. It's called white water. And if you know that two inches of water can move a vehicle, how much more can 30 feet of water do to a human body? My youth leader realized it first and started calling from below, and we started calling from above, telling the kids to paddle to the side so they'd be safe because through that opening was a six-foot waterfall over rocks and water that was swirling. Everything was going fine until one youth who was new to faith and new to church and apparently new to tubing flipped his tube. Now, paddling on the water was one thing, but once he was submersed into the current, it had a hold of him and would not let go and quickly was moving him for the watery cascade. It had been years since my lapse in the pool, and I assure you there was nothing heroic about it. Before I knew it, I was at his side, and I shoved, took my tube and shoved him out of the way so he could grab the rocky wall and then make his way to safety. What that meant, of course, was I was now the one without the tube. And within seconds, I was going over the waterfall. Except this, church, I was equipped. For I knew white water would pummel me and hold me under for a while. But if you manage to stay calm, eventually when it's done with you, it will drag you to the bottom and drag you out and eventually release its grip on you, which, praise be to God, is what happened. 
And I emerged from that pool a little bruised and a little scraped. But let me tell you, all Jesus' little lambs were safe on the shore that day. It's grace. It's grace. Because here's the grace. Because of a grandmother who prayed and a mother who was obsessed with swimming lessons, not knowing at the time she was preparing me for good works ahead. And here's the real grace of the situation, is seven days after that event, I baptized the Church of Jesus Christ more accurately, baptized that youth and his three younger brothers. And all the gifts of the Church of Jesus Christ came flooding in to that family's life that generationally had spent way too much being washed up against the rocks and having water fill their lungs. See, the story that I tell you today is not my story. It is our story. Because maybe you didn't realize it at the time. But when you took that spiritual gift of mercy and you went and you sat with someone who was brokenhearted and you sat with them and they sensed God's presence in you, it was Jesus breathing life through you into watery lungs. And when you took that gift of administration and you, you went and you saw a church that had lots of passion and lots of motion but not much traction and you took your gifts and you organized them and you systematically got them going, it was Jesus in you breathing life into watery lungs. Because the hero in any of our stories is not us, but it's Jesus, who came, although he was equal with God, did not count that as something to be grasped, but emptied himself and took his place with us in the water. In his baptism, he was fully immersed in the river, fully in with us, just as we are fully in, in our baptisms with him. And because he knew that we could not take that watery cascade of sin and death, because he knew we were not equipped to raise ourselves from the dead, he lovingly and with all his strength pushed us out of the way and he went down the cascade on our behalf. And so on that Thursday and into Friday morning, we pummeled him and we did the worst we could to him. But when the sea of humanity was done with him, we dragged him out on the bottom and led him to a rock called Golgotha, where he was crucified, dead, and buried. But oh, church, you know where I'm going. On that third day, on that third day, when he arose from that pool dripping resurrection power, baptismal waters, and Pentecostal fire, when he emerged from that pool and came to us, his little lambs, who were safe on the shore, he did not, he did not say to us, make a memorial plaque and stick it in the sand. He did not say, gather once in a while and point with nostalgia out to the river and say, look, there's where Jesus once saved me. No, he said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the end of the earth. Because Jesus knew then what Jesus knows now, there are still people on the river who are caught in a current they can't get out of, who are being swept away for the rocks, and there are still people, church, who are watching their loved ones drown before their eyes in addiction and are helpless to save them. And there's nothing as agonizing as watching someone perish before your eyes and be ill-equipped to save them. And so Jesus came and said, you shall receive the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, who will teach you and equip you and breathe through you and remind you of all I have said. But because Jesus knew there's a gap between the gift in us and the one that could be, that it's not just a matter of trying, it's a matter of training, he made some of those gifts to be the equippers. He gave some that would be evangelists who would call us out of the water and say that Jesus saves. He made some to be teachers to teach us how to swim in the water. He made some to be pastors to enter into the water with us and teach us the treacherous places. He made some to be prophets to put signs up and down the river, warning us and telling us the truth about ourselves. And he even made some to be apostles to send us to all parts of the river and even parts of the river we have never dreamed of going to. Tonight we celebrate the grace that floods our lives. 
Tonight we celebrate the gifts, and especially tonight we celebrate the equippers. For those who looked at us and made us more than we could be, who saw gifts in us that we didn't know we had ourselves. For those of you who are our retirees, you lifted us up when our faith was weak and you laid us gently in waters of baptism. And especially tonight, we need to thank you because I'm sure we didn't thank you then. For those times you had to pry our hands off the shallow edge of the pool where we clutched and you pushed us, preached us, coached us, led us out into the deep where Jesus is and where all creation awaits the revelation of the church of God. For you, may you have grace to hear the gratitude of, of the church. And know this, that although from now on, your name in the conference journal is listed under retired clergy, we all know that you were ordained. The bishop said you were yoked to Christ forever, and Jesus never takes back his gift. May you have grace on this river to tube a little more and swim a little less, but also to hear the grace that came through you to us. And may all of us lean into the grace. May all of us lean into the gifts. May all of us so lean into the equipping that someday the children and the children's children and the children's children children of this valley near the mighty Susquehanna tell such stories of grace and equipping that came through us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you.